Today I want to share a message with you that I've entitled, What to Do When Nothing Seems to Work. What to do when you've prayed every prayer that you know to pray, you've done everything that you know to do, and yet you're not experiencing your breakthrough, you're not experiencing uh, the answer to your prayer. What do you do? There was a man in the Bible that faced a situation like that. He was a father who had a son who was very sick. In fact, the son uh, was gripped with seizures that were so severe that they would toss this young man into the fire and into the water. And I'm sure the parents lived in panic and lived in fear and anxiety every single day, wondering if this was the last day their son would be on the planet Earth. I can't imagine living with that kind of fear and anxiety. And I'm sure the father sought out every possible solution that he could for his son. I'm sure he sought out medical help. Maybe he was like the woman with the issue of blood who for 12 years spent every dime that she had on, on medical cures and doctors and yet grew no better but actually grew worse. And perhaps uh, this family had done the same type of thing. Somehow this father had heard about Jesus and the healings and the miracles that he performed and so he sought Jesus out. Jesus was his last hope to find any kind of cure, any kind of help for his tormented son. So he goes on the search. Instead of finding Jesus, he finds nine of his disciples. Three of his, Jesus had taken three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, and went up on a mountainside and, and met with his father where he was transfigured and uh, met with Moses and Elijah and talked with them. And Peter, James, and John were just blown away by this. And, and what an amazing time with, that was. But down... In the valley was this father who was seeking a cure and healing for his son and tried everything, and his son did not grow any better. And so he encountered the nine disciples and he asked them to heal his son. They knew, you know, they were disciples of Jesus, and he asked them to heal and to cure his son. Now, listen, these disciples were nine of the most powerful healing and deliverance specialists on the planet at the time. They had been personally mentored and empowered by Jesus himself. Jesus had commissioned them and empowered them to heal the sick and to cast out demons. And we know this is true if we go back. This is the story is in Matthew chapter 17. But if we go back to Matthew 10, we find these words. Jesus summons his 12 disciples and gave them authority and power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Think about that. To borrow some words from Carmen, the songwriter, they were fully commissioned, authorized, and deputized by Jesus to heal this boy. And listen, these disciples had seen all kinds of other miracles, all kinds of other healings. But yet, in this case, they could not get the job done. And then Jesus arrives on the scene. Isn't it great when Jesus arrives on the scene? Things change when Jesus arrives on the scene, I want to tell you that. So he comes down the mountain and encounters this father and his son. In Matthew 17, verse 14, It reads, when they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. He said, Lord, have mercy on my son. He has seizures and is suffering greatly, and he often falls into the fire or into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. And Jesus responds, you unbelieving and perverse generation, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. It's interesting to me that the word perverse means to turn aside from the right path and to be morally corrupt. That's how Jesus described the generation that he was living in. I wonder if that could be true, a true description of the generation we're living in today. A generation that has turned aside, gone the wrong way, and has become morally corrupt. You know, I, I, I don't think Jesus was quite the sweet gentle as a dove person that that sometimes we think him to be. He certainly didn't respond that way here. 
He said, you unbelieving and perverse generation, how long do I got to hang out with you? How long do I got to put up with you? He boldly confronted people's faithlessness and fear and anxiety and unbelief and any other issue, hypocrisy in their heart. That was one that he always went after, hypocrisy. He always dealt with that, always had some strong words for that. But here's the deal. If you're going to grow spiritually, you got to let Jesus call out your stuff. Because he's not going to let you just live with it. He's not going to let you just pat you on the head and say, oh, that's okay. It's okay if you're full of hypocrisy. It's okay if you, you're full of doubt and fear and unbelief. It's okay. I love you anyway. Yeah, he does love us, but he loves us too much to leave us that way. And we got to let him call out our stuff, confront the areas of our heart that need to be confronted, whether it's pride, whether it's fear, whether it's selfishness or judgment or whatever issues going on in your heart. Let Jesus call out your stuff and deal with it. Amen? Amen. Verse 18, Jesus rebuked the demon that was in this boy, and it came out, and the boy was healed at that very moment. Notice that it was a demonic spirit that had gained entrance into this boy that was causing the sickness and the disease in his body. Now, if demons could cause sickness and disease in people's body 2,000 years ago, guess what? They can still cause sickness and disease in people's bodies today. Demons are still around. They're still on the scene uh, carrying out their dirty work. I think that's why it's important that we need discernment when we pray for the sick. Notice that Jesus didn't, you know, cry out to heaven and and ask the Father to heal this son. He discerned that there was a demonic spirit that was causing the illness, and he simply dealt with the demonic spirit, took authority over it, cast it out, and when that spirit was gone, that spirit of infirmity, the boy was healed. I think so many times we, uh, you know, we just jump in and pray for somebody and God heal them. And when it doesn't happen the way that we think it should, then doubt comes in and confusion can come in. I think sometimes that you can pray for somebody that's sick until you're blue in the face without discernment. And when nothing happens the way you think it should happen, then you walk away from that situation uh, like I said, full of fear, full of doubt, full of unbelief. Maybe God doesn't heal anymore or He's not interested in healing in this situation. And really what needs to happen is we need to take authority. If there's a demonic spirit involved, we need to take authority over that thing, get rid of it, and then healing will manifest. You still there or are you gone home? Next verse, it said, the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, why couldn't we drive it out? They at least had enough discernment to know there was a demonic spirit involved because they asked, why couldn't we drive it out? And Jesus replied, because you have so little faith. Truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. So even though Jesus had commissioned, authorized, deputized, empowered these disciples to heal every kind of sickness and disease, cast out every demon, in this particular case, their faith simply wasn't up to the job. That's what the scripture says. Jesus went on to tell them, teach them, that it really doesn't take a mountain of faith to get the job done. All you need is a mustard seed sized faith to get the job done. But the truth is, you do need some faith. You do need some faith. No faith doesn't get the job done. Sometimes even little faith doesn't get the job done. You need whatever faith you need uh, to get the job done, right? And I think people get frustrated 
uh, when they pray for someone and they don't get healed or, or they don't see the breakthrough, they don't see the miracle, they don't see the financial provision, whatever it is that they're believing God for and praying for, and they don't see that, that happen, and they, they, they walk away from that thing uh, blaming God and coming to the wrong conclusion that perhaps God wasn't interested in healing this person, God wasn't uh, interested in this, in this breakthrough. Wrong conclusion. The fact of the matter is, if Jesus would not have come down from that mountain and healed that boy, that father would have walked away from that situation after much prayer. Those disciples probably prayed every prayer they knew, slobbered on him, spit on him, did whatever they could. But that father would have taken that, taken that son home in the same condition that he came and probably concluded that it was not God's will to heal his son. I want to tell you, thousands of Christians are coming to that wrong conclusion every single day because they don't see the answer that they want to see. And I want to tell you, it's a wrong conclusion to ever come to the conclusion that Jesus perhaps did not want to heal this person, does not want to release your breakthrough, does not want you to have financial provision, does not want to heal your marriage or your relationships. I want to tell you it's a wrong conclusion because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus is the same. And Acts 10, 38 says that he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. I love that scripture. It's so rich. It tells you where sickness comes from, Satan. He's the ultimate author of all sickness, sin and Satan. And it tells you how many people Jesus healed. He didn't pick this one and that one and this one and that one. And you know, no, you go home sick. It said he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. I looked up that word all in the dictionary and come to find out it means all. (laughs) It means every single one. And you can read through the, the gospels and many times a multitude came and the scripture said Jesus healed them all. In fact, you can't find one time in the New Testament where Jesus ever sent anybody away sick and said, no, it's not my will, it's not the Father's will to heal you, go home sick. Not one time. Not one time can you find that. The real problem is, you, know what the, you want to know what the real problem is? Does anybody want to know? If not, we better go and beat the Baptist to the restaurants. But if you want to know, hang out. The real problem is people, us, have not taken the time to really develop our faith. And often our faith just simply isn't up to the job. We haven't invested in our spiritual growth. We haven't invested in the development of our faith. We invest in a lot of things. We'll invest in our bodies. You know, you buy a gym membership and you go and lift weights and work out and and you buy that protein powder and that organic food and what are you doing? You're investing in your body. You're investing in your health. We'll invest in our our, our minds, our mental abilities by education and getting good books and reading and putting good information. We'll invest in that. But many, many times Christians will not or do not, or sometimes maybe they don't know how, to invest in their spiritual growth and, and, and really investing in the development of their faith. It's so important that we develop our faith because everything works by faith. We're saved by faith. We walk by faith. We fight the good fight of faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Nothing works without faith. You wouldn't even be here today without faith because by faith, you're saved. By grace, you're saved through faith. And that not of yourself is a gift of God. The Bible says that God has given us in Romans 12 a measure of faith. Tell your neighbor, you got some faith. You got some faith. Just don't go around telling anybody, I don't got any faith, because that's not true. You cannot be saved without faith. You got some faith, but the good news is you're not stuck there. Your faith can grow. Tell your neighbor, your faith can grow. Paul wrote in 2 Thessalonians 1, 3, we ought to always thank God for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so. Why? Because your faith is growing more and more and more. Your faith is growing, he told them, more and more. And he went on to say, and and the love of all of you 
that you have for one another is increasing. Isn't that cool? Your faith can grow and your love can grow. No matter where you're at in your faith, no matter where you're at in your love walk, you are not stuck there. Your faith can grow and it can develop. And you might be a 90-pound weakling in faith, but man, if you keep at it, keep at it, keep, keep building your faith, developing your faith, man, you can become a heavy lifter in the Spirit when it comes to faith. Hallelujah. It won't be automatic. I mean, your faith grows as you feed it good faith food. What's faith food? It's the scriptures. It's the word of God. That's faith food. Reader's Digest is fun to read. I'm reading a great book right now that I'm really enjoying on uh, those 12 uh, Thailand teenagers, soccer team that were buried in a cave for a number of days in the rescue efforts. And it's really kind of an exciting book and a great entertainment. But guess what? It's not feeding my faith. I like reading some things like that. It's enjoyable. But if I want to develop my faith, if I need to build my faith, and feel, I, I've got to get into the Word of God because that's the only faith food on the planet. Your, great, your favorite ne- Netflix series will not feed your faith. Enjoy it, but just realize if you're going to develop your faith, you've got to do something else. Not only do you've got to feed your faith, you've got to exercise it. By putting the word of God into practice, James said, don't be just a hearer of the word, but be a doer of the word. It's not enough to come and sit on Sunday morning and hear a word. It's not even enough to sit in your own living room and and take the Bible and the scripture in. At some point, you actually have to start doing what it says to do. Be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. Everyone wants faith for healing, right? Right? If you get sick, you want faith to get healed, right? You you want you want faith to be able to pray for your loved ones and see them healed, right? But I tell you, you can't wait until you have a terminal disease to begin to develop your faith. Is this mic on? Seemed like you got real quiet. You, you actually need to start feeding your faith and exercising your faith with smaller things before you get to that point where it's that critical. Start, start with small things. When you go into a gym, You don't go in there and start bench pressing 400 pounds, like I do. You laugh at those things. I never understand that. You start with maybe 50 pounds or 100 pounds at the most. But the more you work out, the more you lift that weight, and then you add a little bit more weight, then you add a little bit more weight, Your muscles begin to grow and develop until if you keep at it, you can develop some pretty big weight. And it's the same spiritually. You can't wait until you have a terminal disease. And then you're saying, okay, where was that healing scripture pastor talked about? Was that Old Testament or New Testament? You know what? It's too late at that point. Now, I'm not saying it's too late to get healed. Hopefully, some other people in their faith can surround you. But the truth of the matter is, a lot of times, the prayers of others will work for you as a baby Christian, but after years of walking with the Lord, God begins to put some responsibility on you and begins to expect you to develop your faith and come to some point of maturity. I am not hand-feeding my 18-year-old son at the dinner table, thank God. He, He had to grow up and learn how to feed himself and take care of himself. But yet I see so many Christians have been around for decades and the first thing that happens, they, you know, they're, they're on the phone or they're on the social media, oh, you know, pray for me, it's desperate. Now I'm not saying don't ask people to pray, don't get that, that's not what I'm saying. But James, in James chapter uh, 
5, he said, if anybody's in trouble, let him pray. Let him do his own praying. Yes, you can get other people, but you got to learn how to pray and touch God for yourself. God will answer your prayers. He wants to teach you how to walk in health and healing. He wants to teach you how to get a breakthrough financially when you need one. And so, start with small things. When you get a headache or a, or a sore back, don't run to the medicine cabinet the very first thing you do and get some painkillers. Get in the Scripture. Find out what God has to say about healing. Begin to meditate on that. Begin to confess those scriptures and pray and ask God to release that healing in your body and, and trust Him. Begin to develop your faith with the small things so that when you encounter a large circumstance, then you have developed your faith and you are ready to tackle that thing with the God kind of faith that He's placed within you. You still there? Somebody say amen. Say, Pastor, you're preaching good today. You know, George Mueller was a, was a British uh, pastor who realized that there was such a need for, an orf for orphanages. There were so many orphans uh, back in, uh, in England in the day that he lived, I think it was the late 1800s, that he started an orphanage of his own. And over the many, many years, probably 50 years, he cared for over 10,000 orphans during his lifetime. He also educated them. He established 117 schools and offered Christian education to more than 120,000 students. During that process, Mueller received no government money, no government aid. He never asked a single soul for financial help. When he had a need, he prayed. When he had a need, he trusted God. And God never let him down. God supernaturally provided over and over again. One morning, I think I've shared this before, but one particular morning, the children filed into the, the banquet hall, the dining hall there, and there was a huge table to seat them all. They sat down. The place settings were all on the table, but there was no food on the table. And uh, Mueller came in. And he was very real and honest with the kids because he was teaching them how to walk by faith as well. How many know we need to teach our kids? Don't hide this stuff from them. If there's a, a need or there's an issue, get your kids around and say, kids, we're going to believe God. We're going to pray and trust God to intervene in this situation. So he told them, kids, here's the honest truth. There is no food in the house today. But we're going to pray to the Father and he will provide. So they prayed. When he finished the prayer, there was a knock at the door. It was the milkman. He was pulling his wagon full of milk, just started out on his delivery route, and a wheel broke off the wagon. And he knocked on the door and said, I got this whole wagon full of milk, and there's no way I can get this wheel fixed in time before the milk spoils. Do you need any milk? <laughs> Mueller said, yes, we could use some milk. Bring it on in. The milkman left. Shortly after, there was another knock on the door. Mueller goes to the door and opens it. It's the local town baker. And the baker says, uh, Brother Mueller, for some reason, God woke me up this morning about 2 o'clock in the morning and said, make a large amount of bread and take it to the orphanage. They need it. Here's the bread. Do you need it? Mueller said, we could use it. Bring it on in. And God provided for that meal, and he provided for every single other meal that they ever needed, provided the clothing, the education for over 10,000 children. And not one time did he ever ask a soul for money. Never wrote a newsletter out. Of course, they didn't have social media. But this is, this is what Mueller said. He, he said, uh, he made this statement toward the end of his life. He said, after feeding on God's word and exercising my faith for over 50 years, it was easier for me to believe God for a million dollars than it was to believe God for one dollar when I started this walk of faith. Easier to believe God after feeding his faith, exercising his faith for one million dollars than it was to believe God for even a measly dollar when he started the walk of faith. He simply, at the beginning, didn't have faith for a dollar. And sometimes that, that's where we are. 
And that's okay if we realize that our faith can grow. We're not stuck there. There's something we can do about it. We can feed our faith, exercise our faith, start in the small areas and watch God develop that. What do we do when it seems like nothing is working in our life? My dad was a pilot. One of his favorite activities was to fly his Cessna 182 around. And there was many times that I got to go with him. And there was one thing, one standard procedure that he always had. He would get, we'd get in the plane, he would taxi out to the runway, and he would stop before he taxied onto the runway. And he had a checklist there of instruments to check and so on, and he would verbally read out that checklist. Speak it out, check the instrument, speak it out, check the device, whatever it is. He'd just go through there, there's about a dozen different things. And in doing so, he was checking to make sure everything was working in proper working order before he actually got up in the air, and so to prevent, uh, you know, some major disaster from happening, some potential problems. Well, several years ago, there was a pastor named John Osteen, who is Joel Osteen's father. Uh, many of you know Joel Osteen down in Houston. Well, his dad, John, pastored that church, start, founded that church, passed away, I think, about 2003. But he created a checklist for people who needed a breakthrough, needed a healing, needed a miracle, but yet had prayed every prayer, done everything they knew to pray, and saw nothing happening in their life. So he created this checklist that we could go through to identify uh, really kind of any spiritual loose connection that might be preventing the, the power of God from being manifest. A couple weeks ago, Bobby got into her car and pushed the starter button and nothing happened. And so uh, we nosed around. Actually, she got Pastor John out. She was parked out here somewhere and they nosed around and found out that the, the battery terminal was loose. It was a loose connection. When they tightened that thing up, pushed the starter button, boom. Car started right away. Now, she could have got mad at the starter, blamed the starter, cursed the starter, but the starter wasn't the problem. It was working fine. She could have blamed the engine. Bad engine. Broken engine. No, it wasn't the engine. Well, the engine was working fine too. It was simply a loose connection. When they tightened that up, suddenly the power flow was there again to start that car, and off she went. I think sometimes... We press the spiritual starter button of prayer and nothing happens. And the first thing we do is blame God. Yeah. Well, God, why aren't you answering? What is the problem? Or what, what is wrong with me? And we don't realize there's a loose connection, perhaps, in our life that's breaking the power flow of God flowing down and manifesting that, that answer to prayer, that miracle that we need, that healing that we're seeking in our life. And uh, we just need to discover what that is. So I want to give you quickly, I think, six uh, checkpoints to check to make sure that there's no loose connection in your life. Number one, you need to check on your own heart. Check on your own heart. You know, it's possible that issues in our own heart might be blocking the answer to our prayer. How's the temperature in here? Are you okay? Seems a little warm in here. Maybe we'll get some fans going. Jesus had a great teaching on faith in Mark 11. You know that teaching. He said, if you just speak to the mountain and don't doubt in your heart, but believe that what you say will come to pass, it will be done. You can cast that mountain into the sea. Great teaching on faith, right? But he follows that up in the next verse. He said, when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Why did Jesus connect a teaching on faith with a teaching on forgiveness? Because they're interconnected. One affects the other. Unforgiveness in your heart can nullify the faith that you need to get the job done and see the answer to your prayer. Why is that? Because the Bible says that faith works through love. And if you've got unforgiveness in your heart, you've got judgment in your heart towards somebody, then that's going to nullify, that you're, 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 you're not walking in love, and so it's going to nullify your faith. 1 Corinthians 13 says, uh, love keeps no record of wrongs. So if you're walking in love, you're not keeping record, you're keeping short accounts. But if you've got unforgiveness, you've stepped outside of the realm of love, and you're walking in, in, in the flesh. 
Faith works through love. So we need to daily examine our hearts, ask the Holy Spirit to examine our hearts, uh, to make sure that there's no loose connections, there's nothing in our heart that will hinder the, the flow of God's power. You know, one of the things that, there's lots of things that can lurk in the recesses of our heart. One of them is judgment. The Lord uh, revealed an area of judgment in my own heart this week. I'll just share it with you. You know, when COVID hit, we were closed for nearly uh, three months. And we just really felt impressed with the Lord that we needed to open up again. The Bible says, forsake not the assembling together of the saints. And uh, some other scriptures, we just felt impressed that this was what God was leading us to do. And so we opened up. And I noticed that, you know, around the community and really around the nation, there was a lot of churches that did not open up. Many of them did not open up the rest of the year. And I remember thinking to myself, man, I wish those pastors would open up their churches. People, of all times that people need church, they need it now. What I did not realize is that I had allowed judgment in my heart toward those pastors and those churches and those leaders. I, I didn't see it as judgment until this week when the Lord revealed it to me that you were judging those pastors for not doing things the way you did them. The fact is, it's not my job to judge anybody, to judge any pastor, any church, or any person. They're responsible only to God. And I'm responsible to God, and all I have to do is do what I feel like God's leading me to do and leave the rest to Him. So I had to repent of judgment because that's something that was in my heart that possibly could have been a loose connection to keep the power flow from flowing through, and I cannot afford that. It's not worth it to me to keep anything in my heart that's going to block God's power from flowing through me, not only for my needs, but for your needs. Jesus said there's all kinds of things that come out of our heart. Murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander, and the list could go on. All of these are potentially lurking in our hearts, so we need to examine our hearts, right? And then be quick to turn away and repent from anything that we find. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 11, but if we would examine ourselves, we would not be judged by God in this way. Don't wait for God to judge you. Don't wait for God to get involved in the situation. Every day, examine yourself. Judge yourself. Pray the prayer that David prayed in Psalms 139. Oh God, search my heart and know me, test me, know, see if there's any wicked way in me, lead me in the way of everlasting. We need to be diligent about what's going on in our hearts, and in anything that the Holy Spirit reveals, be quick to repent and turn away from it. Second thing on the checklist, check on the promises that you're standing on. You cannot have faith for anything that you cannot find a scripture for. I think so many people pray so many vague prayers and they have no idea what they're praying or if there's any basis for their faith in it. Scripture says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And then John uh, wrote, writes in 1 John 5, if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we ask for him, from Him. How can you know that what you're asking for is God's will? Very, very simple. It's in the Word of God. It's in the Word of God. God's Word is God's will. If you want to know what His will is, get into the Word of God and find a scripture for it. Find a scripture that promises you what you're asking God to do. Can I say that again? Find a scripture that promises you what you need God to do in your life. There was a woman who came to a pastor and ask him to pray for her for healing. And the pastor wisely asked, well, well, what scripture are you standing on? And she replied, none in particular. And he replied, well, that's about what you're going to get, nothing in particular. I know that maybe that seems harsh to you, but we're talking about getting the answer to the prayer. We're talking about connecting the loose connections. We're talking about not just mouthing prayers, but actually getting answers to your prayer. How many actually want to get answers when you pray? You don't want to go through just some spiritual routine. You actually want God to manifest His power in your life. What time is it? I got a lot of... Let me just mention this real quick. You know, the Bible says in Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing 
And hearing by the Word of God, we're talking, talking about developing our faith. And so faith can come as you get into the Word of God. But the word that the Bible uses for word, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word, is the word rhema. It's the Greek word rhema. There's two Greek words for the Word of God. One is logos. It means the entire revelation of God from Genesis to Revelation. When you read the Bible, you're getting logos, you're getting knowledge. Rhema is a specific word for a specific person, for a specific situation. That's when God highlights a word to you and say, this is your word. Whether it's finances, it might be Philippians 4.19, and my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. Now you can get that word in your head and mouth it off and try to confess it, nothing's gonna happen. When you get that word in your heart and it becomes a rhema and God turns the light on and then you begin to speak that out, look out. Nothing can stop the blessing of God from flowing in your life. It's the same way with healing. It's the same way with deliverance. It's the same way with every blessing that you want and need from God. Rhema is a specific word to a specific person in a specific situation. A woman came to uh, Pastor David Youngy Cho, who recently just passed away, who was the pastor of the largest church in the world in Seoul, Korea. They had almost a million members. Amazing. But a woman came to him, and he walked in faith and healing. A woman came to him, came to his office, and said, Pastor Cho, I've got a, I've got a terminal disease. Would you pray for me? Instead of praying for her, he said, I want you to go to Prayer Mountain. Prayer Mountain is like little cubicles on a hillside in back of the church that they've carved out, cement cubicles, just little ones, like a jail cell almost, that you can go and close the door and spend time with the Lord uninterrupted. He said, I want you to go to, go to Prayer Mountain and write out 1 Peter 2.24 10,000 times. 1 Peter 2.24 says, by his stripes we were healed. 10,000 times. You couldn't get away with that today. I mean, in this nation. I mean, you'd say that to somebody and they'd look at you and walk out and that guy's nuts. But this woman did it. I don't know how many days it took her. I don't know how many hours it took her to write out 10,000 times by his stripes, I was healed. When she was done, she went back to the office and said, Pastor Cho, will, will you pray for me? But the moment she said that, she realized every symptom in her body of sickness and disease was gone. She went back to the doctor. She was absolutely healed from the top of her head, the soles of her feet. Nobody prayed for her. Not one prayer was uttered. She simply got the word of God in her heart. And that word healed her. The psalmist said in one, Psalms 107, he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. Hallelujah. Number three, I got to hurry. Check on your confession. One of the greatest enemies that you and I have is this three-inch piece of meat between our teeth called our tongue. And if you're believing God for a miracle, but yet you go out and tell everybody how much you're hurting, how sick you are, and, and, uh, or how broke you are, or, or how bad your marriage is, and, and you just, you know, you, it's like you're trying to believe God, but you're, th this negativity is coming out your mouth. I want to tell you, God will not watch over your word to perform it. He did say in, uh, I believe it's... Jeremiah 1.12, he says, I'm actively watching over my word to fulfill it, but he will not watch over those negative words to fulfill those. Thank God for that. How many are glad that he, he's not fulfilling every negative word that comes out of your mouth? Or probably none of us would be here right now. But if we get the word in our heart and speak it out of our mouth, God says, I'm going to watch over that word and I will fulfill it in your life. Checklist number four, check on the company that you keep. Mark 4, 24 says, take care what you listen to. Jesus said that, take care what you listen to. It's important that we choose our friends carefully. If you're trying to get a breakthrough and you're hanging around with a bunch of doubters and unbelievers and, and uh, naysayers and negative people, it's gonna rub off on you. It's gonna rub off on you. You know, Jesus one time, he went to heal uh, J. Iris' daughter. In fact, actually, by that time, she had died and raised her from the dead. And what did he have to do? He had to put out all of the doubters, had to put out all of the mockers of the room because faith, miracles operate in an atmosphere of faith. 
Healing operates in an atmosphere of faith. He had to get all the doubt out of the room so they could create an atmosphere of faith and touch the, you know, the heart of the father and raise that girl up, release the power of God into her life. I remember my mom was dealing with cancer back in 1976. And she had to be very careful who she allowed into her inner circle during that time. She had to be very careful about who she allowed even to pray for her because some people simply did not understand faith and that she was standing on faith and believing God. And so it's very easy to speak and even pray negative things. And so she had to guard her heart and praise God she's here as a testimony today of God's healing power. But you got to be careful who you're hanging out with. I was with a group of pastors one time, unfortunately, I have to say this, but um, there was another pastor we were praying for who had a terminal disease, and one pastor began to pray, Lord, help him to die well. This guy was only about 40 years old. Help him to die well. And I thought at the time to myself, Lord, if I ever get sick, please do not let this man get near me. <laughs> I don't need that kind of prayer. I need people around me who are going to believe with me, contend with me for God's best, for his healing and his breakthrough and deliverance. Hallelujah. I want people around me that are going to believe God for the supernatural and contend for the impossible because that's the God that we serve. Number five, check on your obedience. You know, in the kingdom of God, I know this is a lot longer sermon than I, I realize. I hope you're hanging. I'm almost done. Hang in there with me just for a few more minutes. But in the kingdom of God, blessing follows obedience. Tell your neighbor, blessing follows obedience. And disobedience will create loose connections in your power flow. Deuteronomy chapter 28, God says, if you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all of his commands I give you today, the Lord your God will set you on high above all the nations. All the blessings will come on you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. And he went on to list a whole list of all kinds of wonderful blessings if people would simply walk in obedience. So the question is, has God asked you to do something that you refuse to do? Or has God asked you to do something that you have delayed in doing? My dad used to, used to say, delayed obedience is disobedience. No, we don't like to think of that. Lord, I'm just putting it off. I just haven't got around to it. Delayed obedience is disobedience. Has he asked you to forgive somebody and you just haven't got around to it? Has he asked you to make restitution to somebody and you just haven't got around to it because it's too uncomfortable? I remember when I was a new believer, it was shortly after I had worked for Bill Young, who was a member of our church. He owned Young Sporting Goods at the time. And while I was working there, I was not a, I got away from the Lord. And, and so I was working in the store. And when my friends came in, I would sell my friends merchandise at cost. I didn't charge him anything for it. Now, Bill did not give me permission to do that. And I did this over quite a long period of time. And I kind of justified it to myself. Well, I'm not stealing from Bill, but I, real, I was stealing from Bill because he wasn't getting the profit. Well, later I, I, I dedicated my heart to the Lord and, and uh, the Lord, I think I heard a teaching on making restitution. The Lord convicted my heart about that. And I realized I had stolen quite a bit of money from Bill. I, I, in my head, I added up, well, actually it wasn't in my head, I think I wrote it down, trying to figure out about how much money I'd probably stolen from Bill and not giving him his profits. I collected all of that money I made an appointment to go down to see Bill, who was not a believer at the time. And I knocked on his office door and said, Bill, I got a confession to make. I, I stole some money from you. And I told the whole story to him. And I, I gave him a wad of money. And I was hoping he would say, oh, Dave, it's OK. You just take the money. He did not. He kept the money. <laughs> but I walked out of there with a clear conscience. And a clear conscience is far more valuable than any amount of dollars that you can have in your wallet. Because it's in an atmosphere of a clear conscience and a clear heart that God can work in your life. Here's the final one. Check on your praise and your thanksgiving. Praise and thanksgiving is the language of faith. It's the language of faith. Anyone can thank God after the answer comes, but it takes some faith to thank God before the answer comes. John Osteen 
said, check to see if you're praising God as if you already had your answer. If you will act like you have it, talk like you have it, praise God like you have it, you will have it. Amen. Notice Jesus thanked God before he rose Lazarus from the dead. The Israelites shouted before the, 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 the walls of Jericho came down. Jehoshaphat put the uh, worship leaders and the worship team in front of the army and they sang, uh, give thanks to God for he's good and his mercy endures forever before the enemy, three armies that were arrayed against him turned upon themselves. Praise and thanksgiving is the language of faith. Don't wait till you get the answer. Begin to praise God now. Amen. Let's stand. Hallelujah. I don't know if that answered any questions for you. Sometimes we, we pray. We pray for people. We pray for ourselves. And we don't see things happen. But I, I really, truly believe sometimes there simply is a loose connection somewhere. And it can be a simple thing. Just an act of obedience. simply just taking the time to get into the scriptures and find a promise that promises you what you need God to do in your life. Too many times we, we want to come to the front and I'm all about altar calls. And have somebody lay hands on us and all of our problems go away. Everything is good. And sometimes that does happen. And certainly I believe in instant healing. So I believe in quick deliverance. We see it all the time. Sometimes there's a the part we have to play. We gotta, we gotta get real with God. We gotta do some homework, and we gotta examine our hearts, and see if there's any loose connections there. Hallelujah. How many are willing to invest in your spiritual growth? Willing to do whatever it takes to develop your faith, to not only help yourself but help one another. I tell you what. We all develop our faith. This, this, this place will become a healing, miracle center for our community. When we get to the place where we're trusting and believing God, and all of us are well, because we've already got that taken care of, and then the doors are open to the community to come in with their sicknesses and disease, and when they get healed, they're, they're going to know there's a loving God who cares about them, and it's going to radically change their life. Healing and miracles are the calling card for the gospel. That's how Jesus gathered the multitude. He healed the sick. He fed the hungry. He met their needs supernaturally. And as a result, they were willing to follow him. I want to see an atmosphere of faith like we've never seen before. I want to see miracles happen in this house and through our lives like we've never seen before. I believe God wants that. He hasn't changed. His agenda has never changed. He's still healing the sick. In his mind, it's already done. In his, in his mind, uh, uh, the payment has already been made. By his stripes, we were healed 2,000 years ago. Hallelujah. We just need to develop our faith. Father, I just thank you for each one of these believers today. I thank you for their faithfulness. The fact that they're here today to worship you. Lord, I thank you for the faith that you placed within us. But Lord, we realize that there's room for growth. There's room for increase. So I pray for that increase over your people. Father, just an increase in love, an increase in faith, that our faith will grow and develop and increase in every dimension. God causes us to be, become powerful in our faith, in our confidence in you, to see you move, to see you do the supernatural, to see you do the miraculous among us and in our community. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.